Yeah, yeah, we are now recording. Um, well, I hope this goes okay. I've, about an hour ago, I went for a run very foolishly, only 1.3 miles, and I've been coughing and wheezing for the last hour. Um, so a little bit about me. Um, I First part of my career, man and, man and boy, really, I was at Rolls-Royce and Crew, or what is now um, Bentley and Crew as an engineer. Uh, so I was there for 13 years. Um, so I'm really a petrol head underneath in many ways, um, but I'm now uh, converted to uh, what they call a lecky head um, because the last 10 years or 11 years of my career, I've been in the energy sector. So I've uh, sort of straddled both sides really, both the automotive side and the, um, and the, uh, the energy side. <clears throat> and I'm, I'm a car nut you know, underneath in my own quiet way. Uh, and so this agenda is one that um, fires me up more than any other. Um, so I, um, I semi-retired about a year ago. Uh, I joined the, uh, the uh, very early days of XR Cheshire, which was based in Winsford in those days. Also Friends of the Earth member, I think, certainly get emails. Uh, I've also been involved in Transition Northwich. Uh, I've had a Nissan Leaf for six years. I'm on my second one. Uh, I've also got a heat pump and I've got solar PV and I've got solar hot water as well. And we've done a lot on our old house to try and make it more energy efficient and reduce losses, etc. So the whole agenda is sort of in my DNA, really. Um, and one of the things I wanted to do when I um, retired or part retired was try and you know, uh, bridge the knowledge gap that exists between all this technology and how it works and what the future might look like and, and the general public <clears throat> and make, make it interesting because it is to, to me a fascinating agenda whether it's evs or energy in general um so i'm, I'm i've done a few talks over the last uh, eight or nine months this being one of them but i've done others on you know how to keep positive in the face of climate change and, and all the challenges uh, and another one on how we might decarbonize the power system as well as another talk i've done uh, and i'm always looking for audiences so whether it's schools uh, Probuses, whatever. I'm, I'm really keen to uh, to meet as many people and uh, infuse people in this whole agenda and and defear it as well. That's a big part of it as well, I think, as well. Um, so this talk is my take on EVs and what the world is going to be like and and what they're like to own and what the future will be. Um, it's a little bit simplistic in places. I try to make it interesting and fun. Uh, it's a little bit out of date in some of the slides because um, <clears throat> I did this, put this together about eight or nine months ago and, and I haven't had a chance to really update some of the graphs and things in it. But uh, just my take, uh, it's, it's uh, not too techy, I hope. Um, do feel free to stop me at any point on a particular slide, as I said at the beginning. Uh, questions at the end, obviously, as well. And, uh, and I'll take it from there. So let me just first of all, if I can see, make sure I can see everyone's uh boxes for some reason it's on a strip on the side and i want to be able to see everyone in one go but i can't for some reason anyway so kick off so um evs and um what are the facts behind them um because there are myths um what are some of the hidden benefits of ownership and driving and and how to demyth is, is something i'm really keen to do with evs because it's plagued by myths that are unjust in many cases so let me just uh so this agenda uh makes me feel like this really um and it truly does i get really sort of almost almost like goosebumps on the back of my neck on this agenda because it straddles all those various <coughs> various bases for me and and obviously i every time i see a development in the sector or a new owner as i've heard one tonight and and one of my friends the other day has, has finally taken the plunge and, and got an EV. I get, I get really excited, both for the whole agenda, but also for them individually as well. <coughs> because I think these are uh, a fantastic um, opportunity for a number of reasons. Uh, the, the first is that they offer superb end user experiences. Not everyone is really into driving or really cares what a car is like or how it feels or anything like that. Some people are in that domain, which is absolutely fine. But for, for many that appreciate quietness, smoothness, etc., uh, they are a wonderful end user experience like nothing else. Um, they do reduce carbon with a, as, a, as a whole life uh, proposition, and I'll show you some graphs later on that give you some comfort in that. And also from the energy systems point of view, they are, um, and, and how our future energy system will work, 
they are actually a positive win. So although they, they represent additional load on our, on our power system, overall, they are a great opportunity to make that future power system work more efficiently and in a, more, in a, low, a lower carbon way as well. So a few basics, I'm afraid. So I, I'm assuming that um, there would be maybe some people on the on the call today who who are maybe a bit confused by some of the terminology out there about what an EV is, because the word hybrid vehicle have been around for many years, uh, certainly 15 or more years. Um, so a little bit of the basics about the vehicle types that are out there, because we have an evolution now of, of, of quite a diverse range of different types of vehicle with different types of uh, powertrain systems in them. So a hybrid vehicle, the original one being the, um, the Toyota Prius, is essentially a gasoline, usually a gasoline or a petrol um, powered vehicle that also, on, uh, sort of augmenting that or added into the, into the design of the powertrain, also has an electric motor to support that engine when it has a small battery, a relatively small battery. And the idea is that uh, these the hybrid hybrid cars when they are at low speed um, and uh, for short distances they run on electric so they might do 10 or 15 miles on electric but when you go to higher speeds and further distances the or you or you put your foot down the uh, the petrol engine takes over and, and does the donkey work and the long the long distance stuff and the high speed stuff um, but ultimately all of the energy that moves the vehicle forward it all comes from petrol so whilst these are more efficient from a, an emissions point of view and a fuel economy point of view, because when you're braking, some of the braking energy is recovered and put back into the battery, you're, you're saving the, the loss of braking, uh, loss of energy that you have when you brake by turning that back into electricity. So while they're more efficient than from, a, from a, an emissions and, and fuel economy point of view than a conventional petrol or diesel car, they are still ultimately a fossil fuel car. Uh, they do have the benefit for um, city regions where you get uh, improved air quality because you're you're not uh, running um, on on petrol diesel at low speed around cities as much. It'll be much more on 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 battery power. So hybrid cars in cities, particularly for taxis, etc., are are a good solution for improving air quality. So that's a hybrid. There are many, many, many hybrids on the market now, dozens and dozens and dozens. Say so mostly petrol. Uh, there are some diesels in the uh, sort of BMW and Mercedes type era, um, but uh, but they are essentially a fossil fuel powered vehicle, um, and they only represent a very small impact in terms of carbon. Then the next derivative on from that is what's called a plug-in hybrid, uh, which is basically the same powertrain. It's basically a, a petrol or a diesel engine connected to the wheels, doing the main the main the main work, um, but they have a bigger battery. And in, in, in the case of a plug-in hybrid, they are what, you, what they say they are. They are plugged into the wall, or you can plug them into the wall to, to get some of your, um, your energy for your, your journey uh, um, use uh, from, from the electricity system. So they do represent a step forward uh, in terms of um, carbon emissions. Uh, their range is usually is, well, I think it's always, they're certainly better than most hybrids, typically, I guess, double, double the size of batteries. So they will go further, maybe 30 miles or so, but it very much depends on the car. And of course, that's increasing all the time. So they will go a reasonable distance on electric only, and they'll go up to higher speeds, typically, than a, than a conventional hybrid. Um, but it's still um, the majority of the, of the, um, of the uh, energy for for uh, the use of the vehicle is is uh, petrol or diesel depending on the type of use um, and very much depending on the type of use because there are some people who have a, a sort of journey profile that means actually the car is is only doing short distances low speeds it's back at home charging a lot of the time and i know i know someone's got a plug-in hybrid and uh, the petrol engine um, rarely comes into it comes into uh, comes to life so he, he manages to get away driving it effectively as an electric vehicle for uh, the majority of the journeys so his overall uh, fuel economy equivalent is really good and uh, his running costs are you know getting getting towards the level of electric vehicle but he's paying a premium for that because he's got uh, a petrol car a petrol engine and he's got a battery and he's got an electric motor so the, the car is much more complex uh, it's, 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 a, it's the worst of both worlds in terms of complexity 
and the technology and the uh, the hardware you've got on the vehicles. There's quite a lot of stuff to service, uh, both from petrol side and on the uh, you've still got the, the battery side and, and the motor as well. So it's a lot of complexity in those, and that's a transition, a transition type of vehicle from conventional to to battery electric for people who are worried about going going full electric in one go. <clears throat> and then we've got pure uh, pure battery electric, such as the Nissan Leaf, where um, the only thing driving the wheels is an electric motor and you have a big battery pack uh, providing all of your source of energy and of course all of the energy comes from uh, the charging point wherever that might be um, so that is the, the cleanest solution you can get and, and actually technically it's the, it's the cheapest solution as well and, and at the moment and I'll show you some example costs later EVs are still a little bit more than a conventional petrol car um, because of the battery cost but in terms of the parts count in the vehicle, uh, you know, an electric motor is is uh, far simpler uh, a lump of hardware under the bonnet than the petrol or a diesel engine. So the number of bits in an EV is is far fewer, uh, particularly under the bonnet, than a petrol or diesel engine, and far far fewer than a plug-in hybrid. So ultimately, they they are a very simple vehicle in 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 sort of schematic terms like this, which means in the long term. Uh, they will be you know more reliable and as I'll show you later they are easier to service also so the two on the right here whether they're plug-in hybrid um, or uh, pure battery electric they're they're termed as plug-in vehicles so if you hear the word plug-in vehicle it could be a hybrid or it could be uh, a pure battery it, it sort of covers both so that's what that term means um, you'll also so, no, fairly recently anyway there's been quite a lot of advertising by Toyota uh, describing their hybrid vehicles as self-charging um, which is simply a rebranding of the first category on the left here so what they've done is they've been making hybrid cars for 15 plus years <clears throat> and they've now decided that they want to try and um, be a little bit creative and a little bit cheeky in how they market them calling them self-charging and there's a strap line which is something like you can have all the benefits of a hybrid without having to plug in so these are basically a hybrid vehicle and when they say self-charging it means it gets all of its charge from the petrol engine so it's a it's a cheat in terms of how it's it's advertising it's, it causes an awful lot of angst amongst the uh, the ev community because it's it's blatantly misleading the public uh, in terms of making these things uh, out to be effectively cleaner than they are but they are effectively a, a, a good old-fashioned hybrid car and and nothing more than that so this <clears throat> so this is my um my, my my flag of justice here to, to sort of complain and, and make you all aware that if you see this it's utter nonsense uh, it is a hybrid vehicle there's, there's nothing more than that than a hybrid vehicle so a few facts and figures <coughs> um there have been there are many 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 graphs out there that will show you the um, potential um, penetration of electric vehicles into the market in, in any country, whether that's UK or worldwide. Um, the answer and, and, and a broad spread of predictions as to what the EV take up will be, and it's very dependent dependent on all sorts of things such as uh, social attitudes, price of the vehicles coming down, charging infrastructure, myth busting, uh, investment by the, the automotive manufacturers. Um, and ultimately, and, and also legislation. So you, you know, obviously, the the U UK legislation uh, is good. Is now or the targets for the UK are now have been brought forward to 2035 or 2032. So all these things will contribute, but no one really knows how quickly the take up will be. Um, there, there was one um, American automotive uh, executive who said it's like a ketchup bottle. Um, when you're trying to get ketchup out of it, you keep banging the back of the bottle and um, eventually you, you know you'll get ketchup, but you don't know when and you don't know how much. Um, but the bottom line is that everyone sees this as the way to go in the, in the, in the industry anyway, in the automotive industry. They know they, know they have to do this, certainly for, to be able to compete in some markets. Um, they will have to do this. So they know it is the right thing to do, although it's an incredibly... Uh, challenging thing for the automotive sector to do because it is such a different way of engineering a car from their point of view it is a, it is a big change 
The uh, this is a little bit out of date, but the the number of registrations of plug-in vehicles in the UK uh, is charted uh, in in real time on on a website called Next Green Car, which is a really good website. I recommend you have a look at it. Um, it is uh, it is going up. Um, I mean, the problem with EVs is that they you know, unless you you know cars um, and, and and recognize you know, different models and have an interest in cars, you may not spot them. But there are more out there than you would think. It's still a relatively small part of the population of cars. There are 32 million cars in the UK, so we're not even up to the one percent level yet. But they are out there. Um, and uh, you know, I live near Northwich, and uh, the local Nissan dealer, for example, has been particularly successful with not only new Nissan Leafs, uh, but also selling, um, trading and selling second-hand Nissan Leafs. So I see Nissan Leafs, for example, quite frequently in, in Northwich. But a lot of them are, are sort of disguised as conventional cars. So there's an, there's an e-Golf, for example. And unless you knew, knew what badge to look for, you wouldn't know that it was an EV. But they are, they are out there. And, and for those of us like me, I do, see, I do see change all the time. And I see them more and more on the roads all the time as well. Um, this is another graph that's also maintained every month on the, the Next Green Car website. Yes, again, a little bit out of date, I'm afraid. Um, so sales have been picking up. Um, I don't know what the last three months have been like. Uh, Adrian or Paul, do you know? Oh, you're on silent, aren't you? Um, but it, 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 is, it is still sluggish, unfortunately. But So it's still nowhere near where it needs to be. But it's around, um, you know, 4% of, of, of new car vehicles are our um our electric vehicles uh these days yeah i believe it changed a lot in march mark with the new tax ah, new... i haven't seen the figures yet so if okay. Adrian knows better chip in but I'm, I'm sure they had a kick up in uh march yeah yeah but i mean i know the manufacturers are all desperate for it to rise because they've invested those that have invested in evs to date um have invested a huge amount of money and um, and they're not getting any return on it at the moment. The um, you know the uh, take the Renault Zoe for example, they've only sold ten thousand in the UK. Um, okay, it's a it's a fairly um, worldwide car. Many many countries they market to, but it costs between you know five hundred million and a billion to to develop a new vehicle from scratch. So it's it's a massive investment to engineer a new car, and, and they've really got to get the volume to get the money back. And and sadly, in many cases, they're not at the moment but it will change in time. Um, so in terms of government grants to support EV take up, uh, you, you may be aware that there have been grants towards new car purchase for quite a few years now, uh, both for cars and for vans. Uh, car, the car grant was 5,000, I think it was. It's now been reduced a little. Uh, this isn't money that you see if you buy a car new. This is money that is paid to um, the, the automotive manufacturer when they sell one. So it's a subsidy behind the scenes to to incentivize uh, or to help the manufacturers bring the price down to a lower, more attractive, more comparable price to conventional cars. There's still support now for home chargers, uh, which again, behind the scenes is 500 quid. Um, so you're, as, as a homeowner, you would typically pay about £300 to have uh, an EV charging point um, installed and uh, uh, you know, bought and installed. So I think the total hardware cost is about 400 quid typically for a decent charger and, and then you've got to have it installed. So, so it's about an £800 um, installation for home installation, uh, but you would only pay £300 towards that. Uh, there are also government grants towards um, at-work charges and, and also... Um, support for councils, for example, in, in putting on-street charging in. <coughs> um, so EVs is a percentage of total vehicles. Again, a little bit out of date, but um, this is the league table of uh, most of the developed countries, certainly the ones that are EV uh, active and, 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 and tugging on the, on the string. Uh, as you can see, Norway is the country that the EV, EV community is, uh, is all jealous of um, because Norway through a huge amount of resource and money and policy at, uh, at EVs with all sorts of perks, such as uh, free parking, uh, a big contribution towards the purchase cost. Uh, you could use uh, congestion lanes on motorways at congested times. Um, I forget what it was, but anyway, so over the last few years, 
uh, Norway has is, is, is massively um, been a massive success in terms of EVs. And I was over in Norway about 18 months ago and, and they were everywhere. I mean, I was in Oslo and I was just tripping up over EVs the whole time. Um, everywhere you looked and, and they, were, they even have EV only car parks in Norway so it was almost like fast forwarding in, you know in a few years in the UK it was quite uh, got quite a tingle from it um, so a huge success over there and, and the sort of view over there now is that um, people buy them now because they like them and they work and, and they're cheap to run and they enjoy driving them so um, the incentives that they put in um, are you know less and less needed now because people uh, see it's the right thing to do as well. In terms of the uh, EVs for Europe, again a little out of date. I, I have been looking for an updated version of this, but I haven't been able to find one for some reason. Um, they were common common as anything a while ago, um, but this is a prediction from 18 months, two years ago of of the sort of stream of new vehicles that are being launched by the various manufacturers. You know, we, you know, many people would be familiar with the Nissan Leaf and the Renault Zoe and the Tesla. They're the sort of staple diet of the sector and have been for many, for many years really now. Um, but there is an increasing number of models, a very diverse range of models now. Uh, and, and this is, you know, it, there will be double this now because this is out of date. Um, and if you were to look at uh, any automotive magazine, you pick one off the shelf at the news agent, you'll find it, it they are dripping with, with EVs and, and new models that are coming through in the next year or two because all the, well, many of the big automotive manufacturers now are really getting behind this agenda. Uh, VW, for example, massively so because uh, as a way of sort of correcting the sins, if you like, of Dieselgate, um, they, they're uh, compensating very positively um, uh, as, a, as a way of, sort of paying back society by by really getting stuck into into investing in, in EVs in a, in a massive way. And if they go for it, that usually means others will have to follow because VW are so successful and so dominant in anything they do. Um, so question, um, could do with people being off mute for this actually, if there's a blanket way of doing this. How many, how many average miles a day does a new car do? New car do, do people think? Or maybe use a chat for it. Any guesses? Try it on chat. Any coming through? Yeah, I'm seeing uh, 20, 45, okay. 25, 50. Okay, 20, yeah, so 30. they're, all, they're, in, a, they're in a reasonable parish actually. So if you take the statistical average based on how many, uh, the average uh, UK mileage in a year, um, it works out at about 22 miles uh, a day, um, which is lower than you know, people, some people expect, some people feel they have to have an EV that does 200 miles, otherwise they won't buy an EV. Um, but the reality is, if you look around the neighborhood, wherever you live, uh, where I live, you know, all the neighbors' cars, they sit there most of the time going very little distance. Um, there are quite a few semi-retired or semi-retired people in the area, but I know there's, there's quite a few people in the road that also work, and I know they don't drive very far. Um, but reality is, uh, statistically, it's 22 miles a day. And for that, you don't need a very big battery in a car at all. For that, you know, even an early Nissan Leaf will do very nicely. Um, and you compare that to what the range uh, offering is now for uh, a sort of spread of different EVs, of, of different, a, different uh, sort of price brackets. Um, and actually, you know, the numbers there, they're, all, they're nearly all three figure numbers apart from the smart. Um, but even that's substantially more than the average daily use. Um, and, and these are obviously um, calculated ranges based on sort of government tests, but you won't get these figures, but you will get, you know, to within 80%, 90%, if you're careful, you'll, you'll get, a, you know, a, a good chunk of that um, range um, in, in a real world environment. That's certainly my experience. Um, so, you know, the EVs that are on offer today, um, and this also gives you a, a, an interesting spread of how many different models there are out there. Um, it's, it's, uh, it's surprising how many there are that are easily capable of doing most of what most people need in reality. So when people say the range isn't good enough, I, I absolutely do not buy that at all. 
um, my own leaf has got a range of uh, well, winter maybe 110, 120 on the motorway, uh, summer 140 probably. I've had it for six months and I cannot understand why anyone really needs more range. Um, and that's not got a huge battery in it. So I think the, the range, the, the range arguments that people put forward are, uh, are based on a, uh, a, a pretty sort of flawed understanding of how much range people actually need. And of course, if you, if you want more range, you're going to pay for it because you're going to have a more expensive car. So uh, why would anyone want a car that's, that's got range that they just don't need because it's costing them money? Um, so there are a few things that are, that are becoming normal about EVs, which is, is quite nice. So um, from an automotive manufacturer's point of view, they were a very strange beast to begin with. Um, they are uh, the single biggest change, I would say, in the automotive sector since Henry Ford introduced the moving production line. That's the last comparable big change in automotive technology but it for, for automotive manufacturers now it is starting to become the norm to drive to design a car that maybe has a petrol variant and a diesel variant and a hybrid variant and uh, an electric variant it's quite challenging to do all that enormously challenging to do all that um, but the technology is there in terms of design technology to allow them to do that so it is starting to become normal for automotive manufacturers but it is a massive massive change for them to, to give up the old internal combustion engine, not just technically, but in terms of confidence in being able to sell them and volume and make money out of them. Um, it's also a big change, as I, and I mentioned earlier, it is a big opportunity. Uh, <clears throat> and I'll say a bit more about that later. It is a big change for the, the power grid um, that we um, uh, obviously will depend on more and more for EVs. Um, I wouldn't say it's a massive change for the power grid, but it, it is a change uh, and there are Im impacts to it that will gradually creep up with time. But there are solutions being worked on that will mean um, the two will work well in harmony together. Um, it's also a big change uh, in terms of use of space. So you think about the pressures on parking uh, that exist, uh, finding a space, um, et cetera, et cetera, in any parking environment. Well, if, you end, if we have a parking environment then that needs to have some spaces with EV charging, but maybe not all, uh, in, in, or progressively more and more with charging, how do you manage that space? How do you use it? How do you decide which spaces should be um, you know, EV charging capable or not? So the use of public space, whether it's in this environment, whether it's street side parking with charging, it, will, it puts a new pressure on public space that we are all going to have to get used to uh, as a norm. Uh, and also there are social changes. So you, you, you're going to be, people are going to be dependent on um, sharing public infrastructure in some cases. Um, so today, you know, if you go to a public charging point, whether that's a trickle charger at the side of the road or in a supermarket or a rapid charger on a motorway, there are, you know, in, there's, there's a social interaction there effectively between you and other users. You don't want people to hog the space. You don't want to take more energy than they actually need. You want people to, uh, to be uh, sociable when you're in a hurry and they're not. So it's, it's a, it, there, are, there are social challenges uh, with EVs that we need to somehow develop norms and, and ways of working that and, and in terms of etiquette and, and, uh, and, 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 and custom and practice that don't yet exist. So, um, you know, there are, there are odd, odd instances of um, effectively uh, charging point rage with people who uh, clearly lose their rag with somebody who's, who's clearly doing something they regard as socially unacceptable with a charging point. Um, so those were in, in instances are relatively rare, but this does create a new social pressure because we are all competing both for space and and for uh, and for, for access to, to, to energy to, to recharge. Um, but people do worry. People, um, you know, there are anxious people about whether EVs are the right thing to do. Um, is it the right thing for me? Will the technology ever deliver? Um, but my sort of comparative take on it is that you know we are roughly in the middle of this graph at the bottom here, uh, with a very exciting sort of future of sort of technology development investment. Uh, new vehicles, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And there's an analogy for me with, um, with, the, smart, with, the, with the development of, of mobile phones. Um, if you compare the very earliest mo mobile phone, it sort of compares with the very earliest G-Wiz EV. 
And I think we're in the middle, roughly in the middle band here, where just as with mobile phones, you know, when when they first had a touch screen or they first had color, you know, they started to become really interesting. And then the, the, the then the sector took off and, and caught fire with with uh, with the sort of um, smart devices that we've got now. So I think we're at a we're at the beginning of a te technological dawn on on uh, EV development that's going to be really exciting and deliver similar levels of progress in terms of function and performance and cost uh, for the EV sector as we've experienced with phones. So I think however people regard EVs now in terms of what they can do, how much they can cost, they cost, et cetera, et cetera, it's going to be, you know, fantastically different in 10 years time. Um, and, and whatever reservations people have now uh, will seem a bit daft in 10 years time when they look back at, at where we will be then compared to where, where we are now. So we, we're going to be, uh, in a, in, a, in a very different and an even better place from an EV point of view in 10 years time. Um, and I mentioned you know, magazine shelf, magazines on the shelf. My father-in-law gets this every week um, and he gives me big pals on occasionally when he's read them. And interestingly, in terms of sort of making EVs feel normal, um, there are EVs or plug-in hybrids on every cover pretty much, featured heavily inside. They do back-to-back uh, -back tests between an EV and a non-EV. It's not like they have a separate section for EVs as these quirky things. They are comparing like for like uh, Nissan Leaf compared to Vauxhall Astra sort of comparisons. Um, <coughs> and I think that's really forward thinking and, and very sensible. And, and they treat them entirely as great cars uh, gonna get better. Um, and the the volume of of, of uh, content in these magazines that are are focused on EV and plug-in are significantly proportionally more than the number of vehicles that are on the road or the number of vehicles that are being sold. So it's ahead of the market effectively. So the magazines are all doing a great job, in my view, um, of of leading the market and helping the market along and helping defear de the EV domain. So real world use. Um, so yeah, my <laughs> so my my takes on this are: uh, I used to work at Rolls Royce in Crewe. Uh, I used to drive a lot lot of uh, Rolls Royces and Bentleys. They were wonderful a long time ago, admittedly. Uh, and I have to say, uh, a Nissan Leaf is as good to drive and as enjoyable to drive and as quiet to drive as anything I ever used to drive um, when I was an engineer. Uh, back in the late 90, uh, 90s, um, they, they really are. I mean, you really, you really do hear only a bit of wind noise and only a bit of road noise. You don't hear anything from under the bonnet. It is a, it is a super silent, super slick experience that matches anything, even even the modern um, luxury cars on the road, in my view. Um, I also like to compare driving an EV to having a bath. Uh, it's it is like having a bath. If if it's so relaxing, it's so nice to be. Um, if you are in traffic, uh, you know you've got one pedal effectively that does everything. You accelerate the pedal. Um, it's it's a it's a go go no go button. Um, they're very. It, it's a silky smoothiness, and it's it, if you're in traffic, it's just not a hassle. You don't you don't get annoyed. If you're in stop start traffic, you just put the radio on or talk to talk to somebody. It's just a very nice place to be. Um, and also they've got really uh, low running costs so not quite as low as one of these things but I did some sums on my car a little while ago and it worked out at you know, owning a vehicle that did the equivalent of 140 to the gallon <coughs> based on my sort of usage at the time and my energy costs at the time very much depends on how how you buy your energy if you buy your energy on a sort of economy seven tariff then um, it'll be much less than a much better position than that. It'll be a much higher MPG equivalent. But that's the equivalent. You've got a silky smooth car um, that's that's gorgeous to drive. That's equivalent to having a you know, 140 plus miles to the gallon. And servicing costs on average are for mine uh, really low. It, it's 100 quid one time and then 200 quid the next time for a major. And that's it. Uh, and also they're great fun because they've got instantaneous acceleration. Um, I love creeping around car parks silently looking for a car parking space. It's just fun. Um, I creep into my parents' driveway and they don't know I've arrived until I press the doorbell uh, and they're quick off the line as well. So they, they're, for me as a, as a car buff, um, they're also a source of, of great fun. 
Uh, there are some frustrations, um, some that are, over, that are overblown. One of the frustrations you will hear is that you need, uh, you know, 10 apps on your phone to be able to use public uh, charging infrastructure. Um, I think that's a nonsense, really. I've used mine for long distances a few times. And yes, we've had to download two or three apps, depending on which bit of the country we're in. But once you've got it and once you're using it, um, once you've done it a couple of times, you'll remember how each one works. Um, you might feel a bit, a bit silly the first time you do it and you get it wrong, which we did. But to me, it's, it's no more different. It's, it's, it's no more different than um, buying a new smartphone and working your way around that. It's no more, it's no harder than internet shopping. In fact, it's easier than internet shopping for, for, for groceries. Um, so it, in, compared to some of the challenges that we seem to happily embrace in life, uh, that side of it is, is, uh, is actually not a challenge really. Um, and, and it's getting better and more reliable and easier and slicker all the time as well. Um, there's also some, um, there have been uh, sort of perceptions out there that it's all very confusing with different connectors for different vehicles and why isn't there one connector that's common for all. Um, certainly before I got an EV, I was a bit flummoxed by it all. Um, and I was, you know, uh, what, uh, you know, am I really buying the right car? In practice, once you've got your car and you know how it plugs in, you know what to look for. Um, it, it, there is gradual harmonization uh, and the rapid chargers, with the exception of Tesla at the moment, to my understanding anyway, and the rapid chargers uh, nearly always serve all the different connector types. So that, that isn't an issue. You just get to know your car like you would in any car and and you you uh, you recognize which 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 plug to grab and which which uh, which one's for you so that that is uh, a perception that uh, in practice isn't a big deal at all um the thing that also causes immense frustration from time to time for ev drivers is um petrol or diesel car owners or internal combustion engine car or ice ices as they're called um, parking in an EV charging bay um, and, and obviously preventing an EV uh, from charging. It does happen occasionally. Uh, it hasn't ever happened to me, um, but it does really, really get the hackles up of, of, uh, of EV drivers and quite rightly so because there are some pretty selfish people out there. Um, so it, it does happen because the, the social etiquette is, is just not, not there in some people's eyes. Um, interesting when I was in, in, in Norway I was I asked whether this problem existed in Norway and uh, the straight answer was no it doesn't happen people never do it there and interestingly in Norway uh, the same, I, 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 I uh, asked a follow-up question which was um, do people char do people park in disabled parking places and the answer was no people in Norway do not park in disabled parking spaces which of course is something that is abused here so there's a, there's a social outlook on this, which, which the UK has, and obviously many other countries will have as well. But icing, as it's called, and, and this, this habit is, is, uh, is an issue out there from time to time. Um, but of course, as EVs gradually uh, become more dominant, it will be less so. But there are even EV drivers that do park in the EV charging places um, and not charging. So that, that happens as well. So there are inconsiderate EV drivers out there, just as there are inconsiderate, inconsiderate petrol or diesel car drivers out there. <clears throat> Mark, Mark yeah. just to um, do a bit of a sort of time check. Yes. I, I, build, I, I told people we'd be probably done by 8.30. Okay. Um, you're in your element at the moment. Do you, okay. I'm, um, yeah, how okay. Long you, how long are you going to need, do you think? I'm just checking what slide number I'm on. Um, I will push through it quicker. That's all right. There's, there's a few slides I'll skip. No problem. Yeah, I, I mean we, we can keep going till about nine o'clock on the on the um, on the video. Okay. Uh, but people might be uh, yeah. Yeah, you know, itching to get away by third. Just let you know. Fine. Okay. I am um, yeah two thirds of the way through, but I will skip a couple of slides probably oh, and, okay. and speed over some of the other ones. Okay. Um, uh, here's an example of, 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 of icing in a, you know, someone, someone thoughtlessly called this a green vehicle parking only bay and they've got a petrol car, but it happens to be green. So they've parked it where an EV should be parking. Um, that normally gets a very good laugh, but of course I can't hear anybody. 
Um, so some non-obvious perspectives, you can plug in any EV pretty much into three pin plug anywhere. So you can visit a relation or a friend and plug in, or if in an emergency, you can plug into the wall. Uh, you can, as far as I know, probably in all cars, all EVs, you can set it so it will uh, defrost the car whilst you're in the house. So you can have a nice warm car without having to go out and touch it at all. Uh, you can look at and control your car from the, from the house as well and, and uh, turn that heating on manually if you want. You don't get black wheels because the regen braking puts all the energy back into the battery. So you, you, you're you not using brake discs or um, brake pads uh, most of the time, certainly for light braking. So you, you don't have to clean your wheels and they don't get eroded by the black brake dust. Uh, and as I mentioned earlier, they are pretty nippy off the line in, in certainly most of the ones I've ever driven. Service items, there's very little service. You've got your consumables, um, windscreen wipers, pollen filter, tires when you wear them out. Uh, you've got to change the brake fluid every couple of years, but you've got to do it in every car anyway. Uh, and that is it. There's no oil to change. Uh, the service list is a, a tick list of checks, basically. No, no more to it than that. Uh, zero uh, road tax, that's always very nice. You get one of these every year um, that sort of is all very official, but it's a, and you do have to sign it and send it back or do it online, but basically it's a zero road tax. So that's a very nice perk and you get a big grin when you get it. Um, where will people charge? Um, I will just skip some of this out actually, which is a shame, but that's fine. Um, I will show you some examples in a minute. So charging preferences. Um, number of surveys and studies and trials been done. People uh, have a strong preference for charging at home if they can, um, but they want access to rapid charging if they want to do a long distance with, with the rapid charging network being built up uh, in, increasingly quickly now. Uh, but also destination charging is something that's, that's high, of it, high of interest to EV owners. So charging at work is of great interest. If you've got your car charged there for sat there for seven or eight hours or more then that's a perfect amount of time to trickle trickle your day or your week's worth of energy into it um supermarkets are an ideal opportunity for a rapid charge you know you're in the supermarket for half an hour 40 minutes maybe that's a perfect opportunity to to charge up on a rapid it's about the same time you need to fill most most evs up on a rapid charger uh, and then and then rapid charging on on major trunk routes as well is obviously something that is uh is a great interest to people that want to be able to go to Wales or go to Scotland or wherever it might be or see a distant relative. Um, public charging charging infrastructure, there's a real time uh, sort of tally on a, on a really good website that is the, the fountain of all knowledge on EV charging called ZapMap. Uh, fantastic resource, there's a great mobile phone app as well. It tells you what's out there, whether it's working, whether somebody's using it at the moment. Um, and it's it's a brilliant resource that all EV owners will probably rave about. Um, so there's really good information there now about what what is uh, in your area if you need it, and what is on route to where you might be going. Um, few few quickies on innovation. Um, obviously, you've got to plug an EV into the wall or into something at the moment. Um, there is there are trials going on in the UK at the moment on wireless charging for commercial vehicles and taxis. Uh, obviously, for a taxi in particular, if you're in a taxi rank, that makes that makes it a very uh, very easy experience for topping up taxis when they're waiting for rides and fares. So there are trials going on with that. I, I don't think it will take off as mainstream for most EVs. It's just not necessary and it's too expensive for most for most purposes. Um, there are trials going on with novel public charging solutions for roadside. So this was a this is actually a, a DIY installation that somebody somebody concocted for themselves. Um, for outside their house because they don't have a driveway. Uh, this whole arrangement folds out of the way very neatly into the per person's front garden. So I think it's a great picture and it's a great bit of innovation. Um, and the innovation trials that are going on obviously aren't to, to, to do this, but they are to, um, to try other ways of creating infrastructure in situations where people haven't got access to off-street parking. Uh, and there are also uh, large-scale trials going on with something called vehicle to grid where your car can be used as a battery to support the power grid at times of need so exporting energy uh, during the early evening when the energy system is challenged most by uh, evening demand uh, and then recharging in the middle of the night and you make some money uh, from the power grid for for doing that in simple terms so a few last quick myths and then i'm done 
Um, the there are a num you know, there've been many cartoons over the last few years uh, supporting uh, or trying to promote the idea that uh, an EV isn't really green because it's powered from coal. Uh, reality is in the UK, for example, that um, coal is less than two percent of our energy mix now. Uh, in fact, we're on more than fifty percent renewables. So, from a UK perspective, this is this is absolute bunkum. Um, and this graph here shows you a comparison of the whole vehicle uh, carbon impact for a car that's used in the UK. So, hence the, the red flashing box there, um, compared to other countries. And it's very dependent on in terms of how high the bar is on the energy mix in the country. So, uh, compared to the, to a diesel environment on the left hand side, a diesel vehicle. That shows you the uh, overall grams uh, of carbon per kilometer uh, for a diesel vehicle. Um, even if you've got a, an, to, the, to the, next, the next one along Poland, even if you're an EV driver in Poland where they are very heavily reliant on coal, so the, the electricity is high carbon electricity, uh, it's still better overall than, um, than running a diesel. And as you can see, the UK is doing really well uh, in comparison to, to uh, all those countries. To the left, uh, France is as good as it is uh, because it's, it's um, got a very large proportion of nuclear. Um, Sweden, I'm not quite sure. Uh, but anyway, so that if you, you know, there are um, you know, frequently on, in, on social media comments about you know, EVs aren't really that green or sometimes in the press. Uh, and, and this is uh, independent analysis uh, that's very rigorous that uh, that will get better as well as we gradually decarbonize our electricity system. So the more and more we move to more towards renewables, the more and more uh, these these bars will go down. Uh, but of course, the diesel one will stay the same because it is what it is. A um, couple of last um, um, myths and rumors. Uh, another rumor out there is that minerals and rare earth metals will uh, because they are by nature rare earth metals will um, will mean that we won't be able to make EVs in the future. Um, the one set, the one, the one industry that isn't saying that is the automotive industry um, because they know it's not true. And uh, the UN also say it's not true. Um, there's plenty of analysis that shows there are plenty of resources out there. The mining industry worldwide is very, very good at being very resourceful at finding finding stuff you look at the effort they go to to get oil and gas um so no one actually in in the trade is, is actually seeing this as as an issue yes there are issues about some minerals that are in uh, countries that have got dubious regimes but there are other sources as well uh, but no no industry sources within the car sector are saying it's an, it, it's a reason to not make evs they are getting on with it um on the, on the subject of, of countries with with challenging um challenging regimes and challenging uh, working environments. This is another sort of image that's, that's often painted that um, if, you, if you buy a car with a lithium ion battery in it, you're, you know, it's child labor at the end of it, um, that's providing those resources. At the end of the day, you know, it's the same for, or, or any valuable commodity, if you, particularly Africa, I thought this, this graph was interesting when I saw it. Africa is clearly one of the target areas for, for this sort of propaganda being sourced from, but it's the same for all of these sorts of commodities. There is always a challenge in terms of maintaining integrity from a human rights point of view. And the, and the automotive, automotive sector are really conscious of this whole, whole agenda area and, and work really hard to make sure that they buy them, their um, products, sorry, their materials from, um, from kosher sources as best they can. But it's, it's an international problem for all sorts of things, not just lithium iron. Um, last one, I think, or maybe there's one more after this. Um, the battery will only last three years. Is a sort of criticism that I've had um, heard you know, numerous times over the years. Um, they're actually really, really durable, and there's a there are a number of uh, taxi fleets in the UK that use Nissan Leafs. Um, this is one from two or three years ago where they'd uh, they'd done over 150,000 miles uh, with one of the cars, and we're very proud to, to show that off on on the um, on the web. Uh, and the last one, I think, is aren't we just going to create a massive waste problem at the end of the vehicle life with all the batteries that won't be fit for purpose? The reality is, no, there'll be a second life for EV batteries. There are already companies developing products and services that will take um, batteries out of old EVs that are maybe 10 years old. They may only have half of their capacity left. 
which isn't that useful for a car. So the car you know, has got a car with half the range, but once they are uh, deemed no longer saleable as a vehicle, there will be probably another 10 years life using second life batteries, as they're called, in uh, domestic and other environments for storage to support the grid. So when I talked about EVs being a, a positive win for the grid, both smart charging of vehicles to incentivize, pe incentivize people to charge at the right time and second life batteries uh, will mean the grid gets, gets supported well and positively, but also there is a basically a life of probably 20 years uh, for any, any EV battery from, from new. Uh, and I will skip on cost there, I'll move on. Let's, okay, that'll do, time up. <laughs> that's, that's brilliant mark <laughs> sorry to rush you um but i i, I know i did no, say that's fine. That we'd done by 8 30 so let me first say if anyone does need to leave this session now that's perfectly fine uh do that uh if it's okay with you mark we'll carry on with q a and whatever else that's fine. carry on recording and uh and we'll make that recording available afterwards okay There's quite a few chat uh things been going on in the chat window but before we go on to that maybe we just open it up and, and if anyone wants to ask a question um please do so so it's probably worth is it worth just dropping the presentation at the moment mark and getting all the windows back up yeah if, if uh, you can do that okay i've stopped sharing you now you do done brilliant thank you so is there anyone want to ask a question of mark or of Paul or anyone actually who's involved in this. Can, can I, it's Kat, can I just ask, sorry, I know it was just covered on the slide, but I didn't quite get my head around. When the car battery life has come to an end, yep. and then the battery's used again, what happens to the car shell? Oh, that will be treated like any other car shell, like a you know typical scrapyard environment. And the UK has got a, a really strong um, industry in recycling cars. You know, 90 odd percent of a, of a normal current car, conventional car is recycled. Um, so that, that bit is standard, if you like, that's sort of standard uh, disposal methods. Okay, thank you. Um, the other thing I'd, I'd heard about as one of the sort of myths is that not where the minerals come from, but in terms of manufacturing and the resources that go into it, the extra water and all that kind of thing used to produce the batteries and yeah. manufacturing process. What's the, what's the sort of outlook for that? Water, I'm not sure on. Um, the other, they are quite intensive it takes a lot of energy to make or a battery takes a lot of energy to make to actually process the lithium and and so on um but the graphs i show comparing the carbon emissions of you know, diesel compared to different countries that took all that cost of embedded carbon into account um so so yes they are more carbon intensive to make than a conventional car but in use they are obviously much lower carbon but an overall they end up better. So yeah, they, they take more energy to make, but but uh, overall they're better by a long when way. I, when I worked for Jaguar, Mark, we used to use 15% manufacturing, 80% use and 5% disposal in mm -hmm. terms of energy use. Yeah. So 80% is in the life of the vehicle, the energy used. So if, you, if you're using yeah. 50 or 60% of the total energy in that time, it's still going to be very, very much better. Yeah, it's, it's probably worth, I mean, it is worth admitting that an electric car takes more energy to make than a normal car, definitely. Yeah. Um, if you make those batteries using coal-powered energy, this is a very bad idea. Yeah. But you can power them from the factories from renewables, and you'll find that most of the battery plants have a lot of wind turbines around them, a lot of solar panels on the roof. Yeah. And so you make the car using renewable energy rather than burning fossil fuels, and then you've got a much better situation. But um, yeah, you don't want to do it unthinkingly and, uh, yeah. and power a, a factory from coal. This would be a bad idea. I think the other I mean, thing that's worth mentioning, sorry, is, is that there's a huge amount of research going into battery technology to uh, reduce the energy to make it, to reduce the dependence on rare earth metals, uh, improve the energy density, lower the cost. You know, I'm talking of you know, billions now going into it worldwide. So uh, it will only get better. Are they, are they fairly transparent, the car companies then, about, you know, the, the, the energy that's used to make them and where that energy comes from? And so you can do a comparison between car rather than just the vehicle itself, but it's, you know, the process is used to compare that side of it. 
Yeah, so the data sources that were used for that graph, um, I haven't actually read the report behind it, but my, my um, I mean, the, the, the automotive sector is, it, it does re behave very responsibly. It certainly tries to, in, in my experience, and, and I think that it will have been quite open about that because it, it, automotive companies, they all trade on the reputation ultimately. You know, look what happened with VW and Dieselgate. So mm -hmm. they, they want to be transparent, as transparent as they can, but obviously, there are sensitive, sensitive issues around commercial stuff sometimes, but I would think they will be very transparent, yeah. Thank you. Thanks. Okay, thanks, Kat. Uh, any, any more questions from the floor? <laughs> from the floor? Mm -hmm. <laughs> from the wall. <laughs> from the wall, yeah. <laughs> this video wall. <laughs> yeah, the, um, the other big technolo technological change in vehicles at the moment is uh, driverless cars. Yep. Yep. Know if uh, those are generally being electric by default, or yes, they are. Yeah, they will be. Yeah, yeah. 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 absolutely. Yeah, because then you can uh, uh, drop your stuff at your front door. Then the car can go and park itself by a charging point. Yeah, it can go and find its own its own home to, for charging. Absolutely. Yeah. So car ownership our car ownership will change when we get to that. But we're a long way from that, in my view. And I'm also wondering. Um, I know it's off topic, but is there anything about hydrogen cell cars? So there are some hydrogen fuel cell cars on the market now. Uh, Toyota have got one called the Mirai. Uh, there's also a Hyundai, I think. Uh, there are a handful of them in the UK. Um, making a, hy a hydrogen car isn't that difficult. The challenge is making hydrogen that is clean um, because if you make hydrogen currently, you uh, release carbon dioxide. So it's, it's very energy there's no there's no carbon gain by using a hydrogen vehicle unless you can make clean hydrogen um they are going to be more expensive if they ever do come um and the cost of the fuel effectively will be considerably more than electricity so they will be per mile uh in my view considerably more expensive to run more more akin to a conventional petrol car in terms of running costs compared uh, so so quite a bit more than an ev to run so evs will be cheaper to run in my view always yeah, it's, it's probably worth mentioning that if you were to run a hydrogen car today um, from currently sourced hydrogen, you'd actually be doubling the CO2 compared yeah. to a normal car. Yeah. Um, they're, they're pr it's pretty bad because that's the hydrogen comes from gas. So as Mark said, this is a spectacularly bad idea. Um, if, you make the <laughs> if, if you make the hydrogen from electricity, it's much better. Um, but obviously that electricity had better be renewable. Um, the problem there is for each unit of electricity, you're only going to go about a quarter as far as you would with a battery vehicle for the same electricity. So you, you, yeah. you're using renewables, that's great, but you're wasting a lot of it in the um, in the uh, processing of the hydrogen and, and back, you know, into hydrogen and then back to electricity again. So it's very inefficient. So there's hydrogen's a good idea, but probably not wise if everybody does it. It's that's certainly good. an idea that would be a good solution for the heavy uh, trucks, heavy yeah, trucks, trucks heavy heavy uh, haulage and so on um, where you've for got to have cars, it. yeah um, but, but cars no no madness. okay estelle did you did you have your hand up you're on mute at the moment thank you yeah um so sorry just on the point about hydrogen um yeah good point from paul about um how important it is to understand the source of that and um just to share that um we're, we're aware that there's a lot of investment going on in hydrogen as a energy supply and particularly for domestic heating in the yep. um, north of the country at the moment which right. Earth is um, concerned about, you know, con considering kind of whether it's the, the right um, energy source and particularly when it's not from um, renewable energy sources. We've got a comment piece coming out on that soon, so um, oh, share that it. through um, yeah. Helen um, if, if that's the best way. That'd be really good. Yeah, hydrogen's got lots, lots of great uses, but it, not for EVs, not for cars. It's just, it's just not worth it. Okay, thanks, thanks, Estelle. Any any more questions from anyone? While you think about it, I'm just, just going back over the chat, some things you guys may have missed. I know Stephen earlier on said they, they dropped the charger grant to 350 quid. I think, Mark, you had it down as 400, I think, maybe. Was it 350 uh, pounds? You pay, you pay 300, I think. Anyway, yeah, you, you, you get... Yeah. I forget, maybe my number's out of date, but a little bit. Okay. okay. Um, I just did have a question on the chargers, because... 
we tried to sign up for a vehicle to grid yep. uh, trial, but apparently our installation was too complicated, so they yeah uh, they they didn't want to I guess pay the cost of doing doing that. Yeah. Any I- ideas on how how soon that's going to be available to participate in vehicle to grid? Just so, as a consumer rather than as on a trial basis. Yeah, so uh, I, I was in the same boat. I wanted it as well, but I couldn't for various technical reasons with my local network. Um, so it, we, UK has got the biggest worldwide trials of that at the moment. There are 2,500 vehicles in trials at this point in time. Um, so we are the world leader on it. Um, some of the companies that are involved in the trials are intent on turning it immediately after the trials into uh, a commercial offering you know so the the trials are very much with prototype products of what they want to to then offer as a service to people uh, routinely so people like uh, uh, octopus and ovo energy the, the, the two of the smaller energy companies you may be aware of they're involved in the trials and they're the ones that will be leading that so I think you will, assuming the trials show that there's value, uh, you know, that people make enough money out of it as an end user to make it worth their while, then we will see um, products and services uh, that bundle it in with your energy and all that sort of stuff um, in the next 18 months, two years, that, that I would say, maybe a bit, a bit earlier. Yeah, and it, it, it's worth mentioning I mean, it, that there are lots of technical difficulties around vehicle to grid. It's, yeah. it, it, at the moment, is very expensive and difficult to realize the benefits from vehicle to grid so one day absolutely right now it's really really tough and so in the next few years you can get most of the benefits um, of you know sort of cheap energy and things from smart charging yeah which you can do much easier so vehicle to grid is a one day definitely but i wouldn't build up too many hopes of that being mass market in the next five no. years i would say but yeah. you know the jury's out i don't think be, i don't think it'd be mass market because it's technically more expensive but yeah. the, the, the interesting thing about it does it does capture the imagination of the public yeah yeah. The, the idea of being able to sell your energy to the grid is something that actually helps the overall agenda even if only one percent of people do it but just yeah. turning your charging down in response or uh, charging you're charging up and down automatically in response to the sun shining or the wind blowing which is smart yeah. charging yeah that gets you most of the way there it, it helps does. with the adoption of renewables and that's likely to be the more mass market thing in, in, the, in the coming years. So yeah. it's a bit simple that way. Yeah. So is there any hardware need, needed to start doing that or is that a software solution from the electricity suppliers? For smart meets, for smart charging. Yeah, you, yeah. Need a, you need a charger that's got the capability and uh, there are some coming on the market now, I think. I'm not that familiar with it, Paul. Yeah, well, as of the 1st of April, all our, all chargers had to be smart to qualify for the grant. So before that, they were quite difficult to get, and now they have to be, otherwise they don't qualify for the OLED grant. So you should find by default, if you get a charge point fitted now and it qualifies for the grant, it's smart. Yes. So it, it has that hardware in it. Obviously, there's still a lot of development of the services and the software, but yeah, any charger that you get now should have that capability in it yeah. you can do quite a surprising amount with relatively little technology in that respect yeah so yeah it's not complicated yeah. you, you don't need complicated technology to just control the charging and the, also, yeah just the other thing about smart charging is you've got the very interesting tantalizing possibility of um, receiving a message on your phone to say please plug your car in now because the network will pay you to take the energy and, and for you to charge so there are times at the moment when um particularly during the covid crisis when there are some really unusual weather patterns and energy generation patterns and low energy usage people are being paid to use electricity because it's effectively cheaper to do that than to turn off the uh, wind turbines or to turn off the uh, or to turn down gas power generation plant yeah. So, so you, you could be paid to have your car charged. So you, you make money just receiving the energy, the energy which is a, a nice little perk that will happen from time to time. Yeah, it's probably worth giving a shout out to the Omi charger because that's one you can buy at the moment. I think it's 250 quid. It's not very um, expensive. That is cheap. 
it is cheap and well the nice thing about the omi is it's uh, you mentioned how complicated it is it's actually part of the cable it's just like a block on the cable it's really simple but if you're on an omi charger um it sorts all of that out for you and there's quite a lot of the users of those chargers get paid uh, as, as mark said they're getting paid 50 pence to charge their car overnight rather than paying 10 quid that they might have paid um you sort of receive a credit for 50 pence or something which is nice um so there's a few users have been talking about that. So that's a relatively new product that you can get, but it's a smart charger in a cable, basically. Um, so that's that's something nice. So things like that, I, will, I guess, will get cheaper as, as time yeah. goes. Yeah. It's also been good not having to go and fill up at a fuel station uh, at the moment, given the, the risks of paying for fuel and handling the fuel pumps and stuff. Yeah. Right. Okay, just just looking through the chat. Um, I know uh, Paul mentioned early on uh, check ZapMap or even better plug share uh, for you know get a feel for how many charges there are in your area. So you'd be surprised how many there are near you. Is that pretty good advice if anyone wants to? Yeah, and and also people say there aren't any in my area, um, but they've never looked. And you don't yeah, and they don't know what to look for. And because they're not on petrol forecourts and they're not that obvious and they all look different. So um, there are, you know, there aren't loads of them out there, but there are more than people might realize. Yeah. Stephen mentioned, uh, I think the first thousand miles, you've never used anything other than three pin plug charge. Is that right? Well, we haven't got, uh, we haven't got one of the seven kilowatt uh, charges at home yet. So, but we found it's fine just doing it off the, the slow yeah. charger overnight. We're doing the same. We're on a slow charger at the moment. I've been for a while, just off a three pin plug. Yeah, most of Norway is the same. They, they've they got EVs everywhere. Most people just plug in to the, um, you know, to the little outlet. Um, they, don't, they don't really bother with fancy fast chargers. Okay. Um, so the insurance cost as well. Oh, point of the insurance yeah. cost. Yeah, what is the insurance cost like in comparison? As no, no different. No different. I've got three cars, two petrol, and an EV, and they're all about the same. Yes, so. For me, it's about 150 quid each. Okay. Oh, one thing you could do, Mark. Do you want to pass control back to me? Then I think I might get the recording. Although uh, you might get it as well. 